Guibert, Father of Napoleon's Grand Armée, by Jonathan Abel. Jonathan Abel's Guibert, Father of Napoleon's Grand Armée, is a biography of the 18th century French military reformer. Abel's central argument is that the French Revolutionary Army and Napoleon's subsequent Grand Armée did not spring from new concepts, theories, and doctrines of the revolutionary period, but rather were largely the creation of reforms carried out during the Anshan regime by Guibert and his contemporaries. Abel begins the work with an overview of the French army's evolution since the Hundred Years' War, which concluded in the late 15th century, and also notes the French military success in the early 18th century. Quote, France participated in four major wars between 1701 and 1755, winning or drawing all of them, he writes. France's military success at this time, followed by its disastrous performance in the Seven Years' War, proved important catalysts for military reform before the French Revolution. Jacques-Antoine Hippolyte, Comte de Guibert, came from the minor nobility in southern France. Born in 1743, the young Guibert eventually served as an aide to his father, Charles Benoit Guibert, during the Seven Years' War. The French army's crushing loss at the 1757 Battle of Rossbach, in which the Prussian enemy took the elder Guibert prisoner, and France's subsequent defeat in the war prompted a widespread general reflection on the nation's military shortcomings. Indeed, as Abel notes, it is defeat and military humiliation, not victory, that often spur nations to reform. In this sense, France's reflection on its military deficiencies is not dissimilar from the processes that occurred in the German army following their defeat in World War I, or the American army following the debacle in Vietnam. Guibert served admirably in the war and participated in the intense debates that followed the humiliating 1763 Treaty of Paris. Guibert's wartime experience colored his view toward reform. At Rossbach, he had witnessed the squabbling of the French generals and the command breakdown that had occurred. He understood that a systematic military doctrine was necessary to bring order to the military system and end the confusion that plagued the army. Further, Guibert appreciated that wars did not happen in a vacuum, but occurred within a wider context of social and political conditions. Therefore, he considered not only military questions, but questions of these larger issues as well. Guibert's essay, General de Tactique, proved the soldier's greatest contribution to the debates on military reform and began with a discussion about political and social questions. Military thinkers François Jean de Mesnil Durand, Pierre Joseph Bursay, and Jean Baptiste Vaquet de Gribaval all provided ideas and innovations that Guibert built upon in his work, such as Bursay's concepts of mountain warfare and Gribaval's use of interchangeable parts for artillery pieces. The work follows Guibert's rise as a military philosopher, as well as his service in Corsica and at the Council of War from 1775 to 1777. In the latter post, Guibert and the other members of the council sought to implement true reform and return the French military to its preeminent position among Europe's armies. Quote, Under Saint-Germain, they worked for almost two years, hoping to remake the army, state, and society in the image of the Essai General de Tactique. Guibert did not maneuver well in court politics, however, and soon lost his position within the Council of War. The Prussians invaded the Dutch Republic ten years later, however, and the French Council of War reconvened amid the chaos of France's pre-revolutionary period. At this time, Guibert finally achieved much of his reform. In March 1788, the War Council drastically restructured the army, creating new military zones throughout France from which to organize units. The War Council also passed new regulations that Guibert strongly disagreed with, although Abel notes that Guibert prevailed in several matters, particularly the Council's endorsement of his views on columns and the simplification of France's maneuvers. The concluding chapters consider Guibert's legacy as the creator of Napoleon's Grand Armée. Abel writes, quote, in reality, nearly every element of the Grand Armée evolved from its old regime predecessors rather than being innovated by the Revolution or Napoleon. Abel further writes that Napoleon made virtually no tactical changes to the French army, but what changes he did make, such as the corps system, occurred largely at the operational level. Guibert's division system, however, remained much as he had organized it in the 1780s. The book does not merely dwell on Guibert's work as a military reformer, however. Abel explores Guibert's ambitions as a playwright and notes that in this endeavor he was not nearly as successful. Although his first play found a happy audience with Marie Antoinette, who later hosted a court performance, Guibert never attained the recognition as a playwright of wide acclaim. Indeed, Abel characterizes Guibert's theatrical endeavors as, quote, poorly written, but that they, quote, conveyed much of his political and personal philosophy. He was, however, a welcome presence in the Parisian salons, where his impressive memory and commitment to the tasks he set himself electrified fellow attendees. It was at one such salon that he came into the hostess Julie de Les Panassas orbit. The two began a passionate affair, and Les Panassas provided advice and comfort for the officer. 
Guibert's parents soon arranged a suitable marriage for their son, one that assuaged his financial burdens, and Les Panessa was heartbroken. She eventually died as a result of her depression and a drug addiction. Abel's book is a fascinating look at a critical figure in the development of Western military history, who often has been eclipsed by 19th century military theoreticians such as Jean Manet and Karl von Clausewitz. Abel expertly traces the development of the French army from the failures of the Seven Years' War to the behemoth that straddled Europe under Napoleon. Abel also offers a very vivid, colorful, and important view of late 18th century Europe. The book explores Guibert's travels throughout Europe as Western thought in all its fields was at a critical point of evolution. Guibert's travels in Prussia offer engaging greeting as the French soldier mixed company with a court at Potsdam, the Prussian military theoretician Karl Gottlieb Gouchard, and finally Frederick II himself. Guibert's opinion of the German kingdom fell with his attendance at the Prussian maneuvers, however, as he witnessed the great soldier king's unbalanced war games and virtually scripted outcomes. Guibert's journey also took him to Poland, Vienna, and the Habsburg border with the Ottoman Empire. Throughout it all, Abel demonstrates Guibert approached what he saw with a military mind, constantly grasping for ideas and innovations he could bring to France. Abel's portrait of life in the salons is also much appreciated, and further explains the development not only of Guibert's literary pursuits, but also the construction of his larger worldview as well. It was through these informal circles that Guibert, who was never much of a bureaucratic intriguer, made important connections that helped shape his life and career. He counted Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot, and Madame de Stahl as friends. The book is also a great love story with Les Panassa in the tragic role. Abel makes extensive use of letters between the two lovers, and the reader feels sympathy for the salon hostess as she descended into a dark malaise, illness, and finally death. She clearly was obsessed with the military philosophe. Abel notes that his, quote, physical attractions were, quote, rather limited, and that it was because, quote, Guibert was intensely passionate and relayed that passion through his discourse to eager listeners that he drew attention from the opposite sex. The relationship became intense, and Les Panassa never truly released the officer from her affections, even after Guibert married. Abel presents her decline as stemming directly from the ending of the affair, although they remained somewhat close for the rest of her life. The inclusion of this aspect of Guibert's life proves critical in humanizing the man, as did his disappointments in the theatrical pursuits. Likewise, Guibert's failure to win a seat as a delegate to the States General in 1789, where both the upper and lower nobility accused him of promoting the interests of the other, proved yet another crushing blow. The heart of the work, however, is Guibert's role as a military reformer. Abel provides a thorough discussion highlighting Guibert's views on columns, deployments, training, command, combined arms, and civil-military relationships. This discussion is supported by careful study of Guibert's writings. Quote, No other treaties of the period, and for many years following, would embrace every aspect and level of war in the manner of Guibert's. Further, Abel notes, Guibert proved far more a child of the Enlightenment than his fellow military thinkers. Guibert alone understood the shared relationships that existed between the army, the nation, and larger society. For these reasons, Abel concludes that Guibert provided France with its first true military doctrine. From Abel's deep analysis of Guibert's Essai General de Tactique and his later Defense du Système de Guerre Moderne, which illustrated Guibert's evolution as a military thinker, the work conveys the universal truth that military systems are rarely rigid monolithic behemoths, but rather are processes in which those systems either evolve with new tactics and technology or devolve through sheer institutional stagnation. The debates within the French army, in which conservative elements tended to denounce Guibert's views as Prussian, as well as Guibert's own evolving views on the role of the citizen soldier, further illustrate this point. With this well-researched, well-written biography, Abel competently proves his point that the successes of the French Revolutionary Army and Napoleon's Grand Armée did not appear through some revolutionary alchemy or through some singular Napoleonic talent for organization. Rather, the foundation of French success during these wars lay largely with the reforms that Guibert and his fellows set in motion during the last act of France's Angevin regime. Guibert, father of Napoleon's Grand Armée, is a compelling scholarly history of the man and his times, and is a wonderfully accessible book for both a serious student of military history and for the general reader.